So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to iFocus Online, episode 328, uh, number three in the Oculoplasty module. Today, we have with us Professor Nagaraju Ji, sir, uh, from Minto Eye Hospital, Bangalore, talking to us on upper and lower eyelid entropion, trichiasis, and dystichiasis. Uh, sir has done his MS from uh, MMC and uh, is a recipient of the MC Modi Gold Medal Award. Uh, currently, sir is the HOD of Thelmology and Chief of Oculoplasty at Minto uh, Ophthalmic Hospital, BM, uh, Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute, Bangalore, Karnataka. Formerly, uh, he was the Chief of Cornea and Eye Bank at Minto Hospital. He has a teaching experience of over 20 years. And his professional interests include cornea, uh, OCD, uh, refractive surgeries, and oculoplasty. And he has been the pioneer in the state for SICS with MSR and SRS. Uh, his extracurricular interests include uh, trekking, reading novels, or self-developmental books, uh, listening to classical music. And is uh, he's also a thriller movie buff. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And over to you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Is my screen visible, ma? Mm, not as of now, sir. No? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Santosh Vanavar and uh, the organizers of uh, my focus for having me on this um, program. The topic given to me is uh, entropion, mainly the lower lid uh, malposition. Basically, I'll be trying to cover the basic aspects of uh, entropion management. Uh, we, can, we see a lot of uh, educational videos, especially we see ex excellent videos by Dr. Santosh on the, uh, uh, in the, on the net, net, it is uh, readily available. Basically, more than the videos which I would like to share, I would like to bring in, uh, drive to, I would like to drive the concepts, uh, what will lead to lower lid malpositions. I will try to understand the basic pathophysiology of this condition and we'll try to see whether uh, we can customize the lid surgeries, just like we do refractive surgeries. For various refractive errors, we customize. Uh, for all myopia, we cannot do a similar treatment. Likewise, for each and every lid malposition, we have to analyze each and every case, identify the defect, and try to customize the uh, surgical procedure according to each and every individual case. So the topic given to me is uh, lower eyelid uh, malposition, mainly entropy on. Um, how to go to the next slide? Uh, you can ask. Yes, sir. Click and... Yeah, basically there are two types of, uh, mainly I'm concentrating on the lower eyelid. The, the, it will basically, there are ectropion and entropion. Mainly we'll just uh, think about only involutional age-related entropion and ectropion. Both are age-related changes, entropion and ectropion, especially the involutional cause. Why some cases go in for entropion? Why some cases go in for ectropion? That is the question that we have to sit and analyze why. And uh, if you take the general classification of uh, Lid, lower lid malpositions. We have got for both ectropion and entropion congenital causes, cicatricial causes, involutional causes. And of course, we have got exclusively acute spastic entropion in the entropion variety. For ectropion, we have got mechanical and paralytic causes. And uh, basically, congenital cause is totally different. And acute spastic cause is mainly any irritation in the uh, anterior uh, segment and uh, mainly an ocular surface disorder can produce an acute spastic entropion, which can be eliminated by treatment of the cause. A paralytic ectropion is mainly because of laxity of the lids and uh, because of the paralysis of the orbicular circular muscle. So these are easily understood. And if you take the uh, cicatricial variety, basically if you try to imagine the lid as a anterior lamella and a posterior lamella, each and every eyelid has got both anterior lamella and posterior lamella. It is easy to understand. Any contraction of the anterior lid will produce an ectropion. Any contraction of the posterior lamella will produce an entropion. That is very, very easy to understand. Here you see in this case on the left side, there is cicatricial changes on the conjunctiva and you can see conjunctival scarring which leads to entropion of the lower lid. Earlier the causes were our uh, trachoma, even now it is rarely seen in the uh, northern part of India, but in the south, mainly we see such entropion secondary to ocular psychiatric pemphigod and Steven Johnson syndrome. 
so basically we'll try to understand what are the dynamic factors which uh, help us in keeping the lid lower lid in the normal position and we'll try to see what changes occur with age and we'll try to see what are the defects which can occur in the individual structure with uh, as one ages and we'll try to see whether we can customize the uh, eyelid surgery based upon the defect we identify see uh, we just uh, you just think about this all cases of uh, in the earlier this was almost around three, two to three decades back for all cases of involution and tropion there was a common surgery which we, which we which is a modified velar surgery and for all cases of involution and tropion the commonest surgery which was being done was modified cone seismic ascus procedure any case of entropion any case of ectropion blindly these procedures were being done but yeah this is one case which had operated almost nearly 25 30 years back uh, according to the textbook description of modified velar procedure double bursting of the orbicularis sacculi and a small wedge resection still the patient ended up with a consecutive ectropion here you can see this was a case of entropion the patient immediately after surgery post surgery even the sutures are not removed it uh, went in for a uh, ectropion we are uh, uh, looking back we will have to try to understand why this has happened this will analyze it later why this has happened once you understand the basic pathophysiology for all ectropion the common surgery was uh, kun sismanaskis procedure and this was a very uh, sort of a radical surgery for a uh, lit procedure uh, even for a minimal ectropion the procedure which was adopted was a kun sismanaskis procedure wherein a normal part of the lid was slightly excised also in addition to correcting the lower lid malposition we had to sacrifice a little bit of normal tarsal plate also so basically we we'll have to understand what exactly are the factors which keeps the lid in its normal position see any factor which um, uh, causes an imbalance will produce a uh, lid malposition supposing if there is an imbalance in the anterior lamella or in the posterior lamella or the attachments of the lids it will produce lot of Uh, changes in the uh, lid as a result of aging and we will get various lid formal positions so basically lid mal positions are due to imbalances in the forces acting on the eyelids recent understanding of the mechanisms has changed our concept of uh, lid mal positions and it has revolutionized the choice of the surgical procedure basically you try to understand that the lid has got two main structures the anterior lamella and the posterior lamella and you have got a gray line in between the anterior lamella what are the structures in the anterior lamella it is the eyelid skin the appendages and the eyelashes at the periphery at the lid margin and of course your orbicularis oculi muscle these are the structures which constitute the anterior lamella of the lid and the posterior lamella of the lid are constituted by your tarsal plate your retractors of the lid either in the upper eyelid or the lower eyelid and your conjunctiva so these are the structures which constitute the posterior lamella and if you try to understand the orbicularis oculi and your retractors of the lids they have got totally opposite function the orbicularis oculi which closes the lids they are the protractors of the lids they close the eyelids the retractors of the lids your inferior tarsal muscle and your levator palpebrae superioris will lift the lid so these are the retractors so a balance between the retractors and protractors will try to keep the lid in its normal position so you should understand the lid as a lamellar structure for you to understand this lid mal position so briefly i'll be i'll not be going into the detailed anatomy basically we should know that the orbicularis oculi which is there has got main three parts the part which is there in the lid is the pretarsal part you see this is the pretarsal part close to the lid margin all around and this is the preseptal part and of course you got the orbital part of the orbicular sacular muscle this is one of the protractors of the eyelids so so this uh, balance between the protractors and the retractors of the eyelids will keep the there are two opposite forces and they try to keep the lid in its normal position so you should understand that the preseptal part and the pretarsal part of the orbicular sacculi are the pr protractors i would like to repeat it so that the basics are understood properly and the lower lid has got the capsular palpebral ligament and the inferior tarsal muscle which acts as the retractors we will concentrate only on the lower lid in the upper lid it is the levator palpebral superioris which is the retractors so these are the the capsular palpebral fascia and the inferior palpebral muscle or the inferior tarsal muscle these constitute your 
retractors of the eyelids okay so in addition to that so now you have got two forces the protractors and the uh, retractors which will act vertically and there are there is a support to the lid you just imagine this swing this is a swing on which you sit and this has got two attachments on either side the eyelid is also akin to something like this only see this uh, so the plank of the swing is your tarsal plate this tarsal plate and on either side you have got your ligaments the medial canthal tendon and the lateral canthal tendon this um, uh, tarsal plate the canthal tendons will give horizontal support to the lid okay the horizontal horizontal support to the lid is given by this tarsal plate and the medial canthal tendon and the lateral canthal tendon i'll be describing that in the detail later and you just imagine the swing being swung like this to and fro that is your action of the protractors and the retractors okay and see this is the medial canthal tendon you can see it has got two reflections and a vertical facial support and the lateral canthal tendon also you can see very well so this will constitute your horizontal this will give horizontal stability to the lid the tarsal plate the, you should know that the tarsal plate is very thick in the upper part upper eyelid and in the lower eyelid it is slightly less thicker it is around 4 mm in height the thickness is around 1 mm and the length is around 25 mm all these structures give horizontal stability to the lid the, the tarsal plate the ligaments give horizontal stability to the lid and the retractors and the protractors of the lid will give vertical stability to the lid okay in addition to this gravity also plays a part see uh, the gravity also plays a part in maintaining the lid for the lid to maintain in its normal position so it is a combination of the anatomical factors the tarsal plate the medial canthal tendon and the lateral canthal tendon which will give horizontal support to the lid with a balance of forces by the orbicularis oculi and the that is the protractors and the retractors of the lids which will give vertical stability to the lid in addition to that gravity also plays a role okay so and, our, and uh, another thing which you should understand is in spite of all these factors anatomical factors and the physiological factors being normal supposing the eyelid is not in appropriate position with the globe or if there is an anophthalmos or if there is anophthalmos the lower lid will become unstable because there is no adequate contact on the posterior aspect this is big concept of uh, orbito tarsal disparity so in spite of all the tarsal ligaments tarsal plate the ligaments and your protractors and retractors being normal and if there is a no posterior support the lid can turn inwards also that you can see in some cases of anophthalmos or microphthalmos also okay so these are the basic things uh, which you should understand which will keep the lid in its normal position that is um, the anatomical factors the physiological factors and uh, the various um, gravitational forces uh, which act and keep the lid in its normal position in a normal individual as one ages what will happen as one ages uh, the anatomy changes in the face and likewise in the lid also the eyelid skin as one ages become thin atrophic and lax it will become very thin atrophic and lax and the tarsal ligaments that is your uh, uh medial palpebral medial palpebral ligament and the lateral palpebral ligament also can become thin and it can become stretched out also the tarsal ligaments can become thin and it will become stretched out it is just like a rubber band which has lost its uh, laxity and your inferior lid retractors the lid retractors will which will retract the lid lower down can become very lax and they can show dehiscence like you see dehiscence in uh, upper eyelid in a case of aponeurotectosis you can see dehiscence even in the lower lid eyelid retractors and this can be seen in both ectopian and entropian this you should understand because um, uh, even jones procedure what we do for an entropian is advised even in case of ectopian okay so the laxity of the skin the stretching of the tarsal plate the thinning of the tarsal, tarsal plate and the ligaments and the weakness or the dehiscence and the laxity the lack of elasticity of the inferior retractors all these things will constitute aging changes in the lid and it has been demonstrated by sisler that um, there are some peculiar changes which can occur in entropian and which can occur in ectropian see both are aging changes that is the cause of uh, 
Yeah, senile entropion is one of the causes aging. The cause of uh, senile ectopion is also aging. Uh, these involutional changes can occur in both the conditions, but why some islets going for entropion, why some islets going for ectropion is the question. Sisler has demonstrated that patients with entropion as they usually will be having more hypertrophy of the orbicularis sarcoli. The orbicularis sarcoli muscle will show hypertrophic changes. Uh, whereas in the case of ectropion, ectropion, that is involutional ectropion, the orbicularis sarcoli will show more of atrophic changes and ischemic changes. So what I mean to say, the uh, muscle, the orbicularis muscle that I'll be describing you later will be almost normal or sometimes it can be hypertrophied in a case of involutional entropion, whereas in a case of involutional ectropion, there are more degenerative changes, ischemic changes, atrophic changes which occur in the orbicularis sarcoli. And that is one factor which will influence the position of the lid in entropion and ectropion. And um, it has been seen that lamellar dissociation, lamellar dissociation that is uh, because of the loss of fibers of the preceptal orbicular sarcoli attachment to the orbital septum, there will be some migration of the pre-tarsal part over the preceptal, the preceptal part over the pre-tarsal part of the orbicular sarcoli muscle. See, there will be uh, fiber attachments uh, which will separate the migration of the preceptal part of the orbicular sarcoli to the pre over the pre-tarsal normally. And uh, in a case of involutional changes, especially in case of your uh, entropion, there will be loss of these fibers of the preceptal orbicular sarcoli, uh, which is attached to the orbital septum. So this uh, preceptal part of the orbicular sarcoli muscle will override the pre-tarsal part of the orbicular sarcoli muscle. And uh, because of these changes, hypertrophy of the orbicular sarcoli, the overriding of the preceptal or the pre-tarsal part, because of the lack of, lack of attachment to the uh, attachment fascia there, and in addition to the aging changes in the tarsal plate, tarsal plate, which has undergone a little bit of thinning, okay, what happens? The tarsal plate will buckle inside, according to sister, and it will turn in inside. Okay, that is what happens. Uh, so, so why doesn't ectropion occur? In the case of ectropion, what usually happens is, like I told you, the skin changes are the same in both. The muscle in a case of ectropion is usually what happens, it shows a lot of ischemic changes and uh, atrophic changes. In addition to that, what usually happens, the tarsal plate will become slightly larger. They say slight inflammatory hypertrophy can occur because this ectropion, because of chronic changes, what starts as a medial ectropion can go in for a full-fledged uh, gross ectropion or it can go in for a tarsal ectropion also with a lot of inflammatory hypertrophy of the conjunctiva. So there will be a lot of changes in the tarsal plate also the tarsal plate can become slightly thick and stretched out and it can be slightly sort of labile thing. And basically the tarsal plate, because of this aging changes, it will try to buckle outwards. Whereas in a case of entropion, the tarsal plate, which is very thinner because of these forces, the overriding muscle, overriding muscle and uh, the lack of the, uh, this thing, the retractors being uh, dehisa, there is a dehiscence of the retractors, the lower lid retractors, the, ma, ma, this thing, the lid will buckle inwards in a case of entropion rather than in a case of ectropion. These are the changes which can occur as one ages. In addition to that, as I told you, the big concept, the globe, what happens, especially as one aging, as one ages, what happens, there will be loss of orbital fat, there will be loss of orbital volume. So there will be a little bit of... Uh, enough thalmus also, and basically the lid will buckle inwards in a case of entropion. Whereas in a case of ectropion, because of the lax tarsal plate, the lid will fall outwards. Similar changes can be seen in case of involutional process also. And sometimes we see both, uh, so in some cases, if you can observe properly, there'll be a little bit of involutional process changes in some patients of involutional lid malpositions too. So basically, now I think all of you should have understood what exactly happens in as one ages in a case of involutional entropion, the changes in the lid, the anatomical changes, the pathophysiological changes, the, because of the changes in the forces, because of the lack of uh, uh, tonicity of the orbicular acalyl muscle and lack of a proper attachment of the retractors or the retractors of the lids. These all results in changes which will lead to lid malpositions. So 
once you get a case of uh, lid mal position you have to try to identify each and every specific and now you have understood what exactly is happening you have to try, try to find out whether each and uh, every point what i told you is present in that particular condition or, or not so you have to identify what exactly is happening in each and every case of lid mal position we'll confine ourselves only to involutional entropy and we'll try to identify whether the changes are there on the medial side or on the lateral side or it is on the tarsal plate that is there is a problem in the horizontal lid laxity or whether there is a problem in the vertical lid laxity also if there is a laxity we'll try to find out where exactly it is there whether it is only on one side only on the medial side or on the lateral side and we'll try to assess the severity of the condition also whether it is a very mild condition moderate condition or very severe condition because this lid positions can lead to corneal blindness also so this is very important and of course you have to see the conjunctiva and the cornea also <clears throat> and all cases you should see whether the patient has got lag of thermos <clears throat> and you should try to assess the orbicularis tone also <clears throat> so a complete ocular examination is a must in all cases of lid mal position it is not just managing the lid you have to manage the patient as a whole and you should manage the eye as a whole also complete ocular examination give special importance to the cornea give special important to the importance to the tear film and document all your changes try to observe the face of the patient see whether the face is normal or whether there are any other changes also <clears throat> and involutional changes can occur in other parts of the this thing also right like your dermatocalcis in the upper lid also can occur okay so a clinical evaluation you should ask for symptoms like tearing redness foreign body sensation photophobia because of uh, involvement of the cornea and even defective vision can be seen past history you should ask for history of nevomatitis trauma surgery irradiation burns and trachoma <clears throat> medical history especially in case of uh, if you are suspecting uh, cicatricial changes <clears throat> like steven johnson syndrome ocp or any drug allergies so basically what all changes occur in the lid can produce lot of changes in the lid margin also lid margin classically it is described that the lid margin appears like a gothic structure you can see here no <clears throat> this is something like a gothic arch yeah that is more you will see a sharp edge in a case of involutional entropion whereas in a case of involutional ectropion it is more rounded okay this is one thing which you should note and all cases you try to see the identify the position of the lid crease the lash position direction posterior lid margin the meibomian gland the tarsal conjunctiva and the patency of the lacrimal excretory apparatus all these things you have to complete you should see look for all these things so the lid crease which is between the tarsals and the septal area is an important sign of functioning posterior attachment of the orbicularis muscle translamellar connections of the capsular palpebral fascia insert into the preseptal orbital muscle okay so next is you have to see once you see whether the presence of the lid crease everything you see properly then you have to try to identify whether the patient has got an horizontal lid laxity or whether there is a lid laxity confined only on the medial side or on the lateral side so how do you test for medial canthal laxity so ask the patient to look straight ahead with the head in the primary position note the position of the lacrimal punctum then slowly you try to pull the lid laterally with the patient looking straight ahead and if you see that the lid is that you try to observe the punctum if the punctum is moving more than 5 mm over the lid nearer to the nasal limbus that, that indicates it is significant that there is a significant medial canthal laxity this is how you test the medial canthal laxity so how do you test the lateral canthal laxity lateral canthal laxity also uh, you can test it likewise only pull the lid medially and try to see whether normally the lateral angle of the the lateral canthal area of the lid is almost almond shaped if you try to observe carefully even before you try to check for the lateral canthal laxity the angle of the lateral canthus will become more rounded in a case of involutional 
entropy and because of the involution and changes that almond shaped structure of the palpebral fissure is usually lost and you try to pull the lid medially you can see there is a significant horizontal laxity okay there is another test called as the distraction test you just pull the lower lid you just keep your thumb on the patient's lower lid and try to pull it and if you try if you can try to bring the lid more than 6 mm away from the cornea with the patient looking straight at in the primary position it indicates there is a significant lower lid laxity this horizontal lid laxity is a combination of laxity of the tarsal plate the medial canthal tendon and the lateral canthal tendon okay <clears throat> and another way of testing this horizontal lid laxity is your snap back test it is a simple test you just as the patient looks straight at you just pinch the lower lid margin you pull it and just leave it back in a normal person it springs back and assumes its normal position it returns back it, it returns back to its normal position that is a normal condition supposing if it takes slightly some time to return it indicates there is a mild laxity okay supposing you try to retract it you just pinch it and you leave it back it doesn't return it, if, if it requires a blink to return back to its normal position it indicates there is a moderate horizontal lid laxity okay supposing even if you try to pinch it out and you leave it back even after a blink if it doesn't return back it indicate there is a severe laxity so the grading of your horizontal lower lid laxity by this snap back test can be mild moderate or severe mild the lid will return back to its normal position moderate it takes a blink to go back to its normal position even with a blink it doesn't go back then it is a severe laxity this is what you see this is a normal uh, lid laxity here you see even after a blink it doesn't go back okay <clears throat> the other thing is the intracanthal line the, this is one new concept uh, which is very interesting it is um, just academically it is very interesting to just to know about this intracanthal line is the shortest line drawn on the globe surface from the lateral canthus to the lacrimal punctum continues to the posterior limb of the medial canthal tendon creating an angle with the lid margin the equatorial line usually connects the medial canthus and the lateral canthus see the shortest line drawn on the globe from the lateral canthus to the lacrimal punctum which continues to the posterior limb of the medial canthus is your intracanthal line now one second okay so the line can i this is the one line this this is that line and this is the equatorial line so these two lines the intracanthal line and the equatorial line now um, this the position of these two lines are very important see in a normal person the both the lines are equal they are identical identical the equatorial line and the intracanthal line are almost equal you try to connect a line from here like this lateral canthal to the medial punctum like this and you connect both the medial canthal area and the lateral canthal area it is almost identical in a case of medial entropion there is a loss of angle at the lacrimal punctum here there is a loss of angle due to the medial canthal laxity and there will be a slight angle between your equatorial line and the intracanthal line and in a case of ectropion uh, you just remember this is in ectropion the punctum is much lower down so there is a the intracanthal line is more at a lower level than in the equatorial line this is just for an academical uh, purpose so that you will understand and you will try to look for the punctum also most of the time the lid surgeries are managed without uh, testing the uh, lacrimal excretory apparatus so it is mandatory for all Uh, patients who undergo who have got lid malposition you have to check the lacrimal excretory apparatus also okay and uh, in proptosis also you can see the icl will be lower than the equatorial line because of all this uh, changes this is an interesting concept so now you have understood what are the anatomical changes which occur what are the pathophysiological factors which will influence the lid malpositions now you know how to identify each and every structure and you can identify Um, whether the patient has got a significant horizontal lid laxity or a vertical lid laxity and now it is time for us to customize the surgery based upon the anatomical defects we identify so this is a case of involution and entropy on this is a case of cicatricial upper lid 
entropy on okay so the differential diagnosis for all your entropy on is stichiasis stichiasis the lid is in its normal position the eyelashes are touching the globe the management um, basically you can do epilation initially or you can go in for a radio ablation or there's a radio frequency ablation for some cases and for distichiasis and epibliferon uh, these are congenital conditions sometimes you might have to surgically remove the roots of the eyelashes also and uh, what metaplastic eyelashes what you see in some cases of uh, cicatricial entropy and in uh, steven johnson syndromes are very very difficult to treat you do what, whatever you do uh, there will be another metaplastic eyelash which will appear somewhere else and it is a very difficult condition to treat but most of the times they you can treat them well with radio frequency ablation and trauma can also produce this slightly lit small position and these are the differential diagnosis of your involution entropy on so once you i uh, identify that your case is an involution entropy on you can classify it into mild moderate and severe that is what kemp and colin has uh, graded but this is not of much useful clinically like i told you assess the punctal position patency the laxity of the tendons by all the tests which i told you and um, I'll, I'll i'll try to explain in detail what will happen if there is a vertical laxity and there is uh, detachment of the inferior retractors of the lids in the later um, part of the presentation so basically what exactly happens in a case of involution entropy on now understanding the anatomy and the pathophysiology we know that there is a lamellar dissociation in case of entropy on there is a problem in the vertical retractors forces between the retractors and the protractors of the lids because of the weakness of the retractors and there is of course lid laxity also see these three factors lid laxity is there inferior retractors weakness is there and lamellar dissociation is there and this is a slide which i have adopted from one of the lecture uh, by collins uh, at course which i um, which was hosted at uh, hyderabad by dr santosh anwar evidence i think it was in 2012 uh, this is the, these are the points from that slide he says that uh, in involution entropy and lamellar dissociation is the main thing which produces the lid to turn inwards and the next thing which comes is your inferior retractors weakness or the dehiscence and the last is the lid horizontal lid laxity whereas in a case of uh, ectopy and the lid laxity comes first and all these things are secondary so you should remember in involution entropy and the lamellar dissociation inferior retractors dehiscence and the horizontal lid laxity comes in that order okay so what exactly happens I'll, these are the points uh, which you see in any standard textbooks from like kanske also there is vertical instability of the lid because of this lamellar separation due to dehiscence of the inferior retractors of the lids okay there is vertical instability is main thing what you see and basically what will happen the preseptal part of the orbicular circle will override the pretarsal part here you can see the muscle the orbicular circle muscle is thick vertical instability and there is a overriding of this muscle and in addition to that the patient will be having lid laxity horizontal lid laxity you try to check for the horizontal the patient will be having a lax medial canthal tendon and some cases the lateral canthal tendon all these factors what will happen in addition to age related change because of in of thalamus orbital fat atrophy the eyelid will try to go backwards so these changes that is the vertical instability of the lid that is the dehiscence of the inferior retractors of the lids the overriding of the preseptal part or the pretarsal part and your horizontal lid laxity because of the laxity of the medial canthal tendon and the lack of the age related none of thalamus will result in the lid turning in inwards in addition to that what happens when the patient closes the lids the upper eyelid will exert the pressure over the eyelid lower eyelid and the eyelid will go backwards all these factors will re result in entropy on and what happen, how do you identify whether the patient has got a vertical laxity especially if the patient has got a inferior retractor dehiscence so normally this is the lid what you see normally in a normal individual you sometimes you can see a white subconjunctival line uh, when you avert the lower lid in a case of a involution entropy on that is your 
uh, inferior retractors which are separated that is that is the detached inferior retractors which are see, which you see below the tarsal plate below the tarsal plate you see that white line that is your that is a sign i if you get a, in a, in a individual you just try to see revert the lid and see if you see a white line that is one of the sign to say it is an inferior retracted dehiscence and you try to see the furnaces furnaces of the patient and you see these furnaces are normal compared to a normal individual it is there much deeper and the lower eyelid is at a slightly higher position than normal especially in case of involutional entropion and you try to ask the patient to look down the lid will slightly move up and move up and sometimes there will be no movement of the lid also on downward gaze you ask the patient to look down the lid will not move down and also because the inferior retractors are not working there and sometimes you can see fat prolapse sign that is the furnacial fat prolapse sign so the vertical laxity of the lids mainly because of the dehiscence of the inferior retractors of the lid the signs are the white line the fornix being deeper the lower eyelid is being at a higher position than normal and there is little movement or no movement on inferior movement of the lower eyelid on down gaze and sometimes you can see a prolapse of the orbital fat also so once you do all those things you document your entropion and this way severity whether it is in the upper eyelid or the lower eyelid and of course you document whether all these things are present or there or not so that you can decide what you have to do for any case this is another case of uh, entropion and in an elderly patient usually the entropion will be a chronic uh, problem they will not come with an acute uh, entropion it, it will be usually a chronic uh, entropion and usually in such cases you try to avoid the lid it is very very easy because of the laxity of the tendons and the structures of the eyelid and on down, down case sometimes the eyelid lower eyelid will try to roll inwards that is that was first noticed by dons by jones as the patient look down sometimes the lower eyelid will roll inwards in case of entropion so now we come to that modified wheeler's operation which uh, uh, we were doing earlier and why it should not be done see i told you double breasting of the orbicular sacculi a very small wedge resection we try to correct the horizontal lid laxity and uh, still the lid even though the, um, the lid is like this it is not in position with its uh, structure the uh, lid which has turned inwards has come outwards because basically we have not addressed the canthal laxity properly so we have tried to slightly try to see whether we, have, we can just create some force there by just double pressing the orbicular sacculi muscle but that is that doesn't suffice and uh, basically even though the tarsal plate is normal in the sense even though it will be slightly atrophic basically it will be normal in case of involutional entropion unnecessary we are removing the tarsal plate just to shorten the lower lid and whereas we could have addressed the canthal laxity which is not being done in modified wheeler surgery and moreover the important uh, factor like i told you the lamellar separation because of the inferior retractors dehiscence we don't consider this at all in modified wheeler separation that is why this procedure what was being done around 2 3 day 2 to 3 decades back is in vogue now medical management some cases temporarily we can tape the uh, tape the lids and um, topical antibiotics and lubricants and for ocular cicatricial uh, pemphigoid we can give dapsone and since some resistant cases of uh, spastic um, entropion we can try even chemo denervation okay so for congenital entropion just observation lid taping or a suture correction a snellen suture or an hodes procedure wherein you can try to uh, uh, excise an elliptical uh, area of skin along with the muscle and try to suture the skin the orbicularis muscle the tarsal plate and the skin and that will correct your entropion but for your inhalational entropion what is the plan what are the principles of treatment for a surgical uh, surgical treatment for an inhalational entropion you have to try to correct the horizontal lid laxity that is one thing second thing is we should try to create a barrier between the i told you know the preceptal part will override the pretarsal part we should try to create a barrier here so that this preceptal part doesn't migrate upwards and we know no the inferior retractors of the lids they will be dehiscence we'll try to see whether we can attach it back so these are the principles of correction of involutional entropia so basically first thing is if there is more of vertical lid laxity with the horizontal lid laxity being normal that is you see all the signs of 
your inferior inferior retractors dehiscence and if there is no significant medial canthal laxity or lateral canthal laxity and all your snapback test pinch test and detraction uh, distraction tests are normal you can just correct the capsular capsular palpebral facial uh, dysfunction okay and if there is a associated along with that you should try to address this overriding so basically you should try to create a barrier between the part of the preceptal part and the pretarsal part of the orbicular sacular muscle and supposing on examination and evaluation if there is a significant horizontal lid laxity also you should try to correct that and in supposing on clinical examination if you notice that there are changes on the posterior lamellae that is more so in a case of cicatricial entropion you have to try to see whether you can do something to see that a particular pathology is addressed to okay so in all cases of uh, involutional entropion once you have identified the entropion you have graded the entropion to identify the different uh, uh, structures whether it is an horizontal lid laxity or a vertical lid laxity then you can think of doing what you can think what procedures you can think of while doing uh, for entropion basically if there is only vertical lid stability in a patient who is a very invalid patient a bedridden patient who is not fit to undergo surgery you can try to go in for a temporary quicker sutures that basically the principle is we basically i'll just uh, describe that later you see these are the four procedures which are described if there is only vertical lid instability supposing with the along with the vertical lid instability you got horizontal lid laxity also you combine these procedures with your lateral tarsal step procedure in an elderly patient i told you in an invalid patient what you can do you can just put a transfer suture here if the bedridden patient who is not fit for surgery what you can do you can just put a suture here how does this act it will create a barrier between the pretarsal plate and the pre septal part and that migration is slightly avoided because of the scarring there and basically it will you can slightly see that we can slightly put a slightly averting suture of uh, uh, quicker and uh, rathbun which will which is a temporary suture so that the lid is pulled outwards once the general condition of the patient improves you can think of doing a permanent permanent surgical procedure so next is the other procedure this we are uh, not doing in our hospital a vis procedure especially that is not in not in uh, not for involutional entropion we can try to uh, this is the principle of your vis procedure it is a full thickness horizontal eyelid incision and this you can combine with a everything suture also this is usually done for entropion with little or no lid uh, horizontal lid laxity okay uh, for upper lid we have done this process that i'll be describing you later and a quickers procedure is this vis procedure along with a little bit of horizontal lid shortening also this is usually done in patients of entropion with a significant horizontal lid laxity okay so modified jones procedure this is the main uh, procedure which uh, is recommended for involutional entropion right now basically it is done for those cases where there is vertical instability vertical lid laxity and basically it is plication of the lower lid retractors and this is a procedure which we can do when all the other procedures for entropion other surgical procedures have failed and especially in recurrent cases also you can do this procedure basically this is i'll just show you some slides this is your uh, involutional entropion this is how you this is a surgery which i have done almost 15 20 years back you can see marking the incision 4 to 5 mm on the skin we didn't have any radio frequency cautery at that time basically then retractive or orbicular sacral muscle you see the orbital septum then you can identify the retractors you can see that white line there you can see that white line there this is your these are your inferior retractors and if there is an excess skin you can try to excise the excess skin there then you take a bite with absorbable sutures from the orbicular sacral muscle the inferior retractors of the lids the tarsal plate the orbicular sacral muscle and then you can tighten it and of course sometimes you can 
and of course you have to close the skin with proline this is how you do the jones procedure and basically when you identify the inferior retractors of the lids you hold the lid with a non tooth you hold the orbital uh, inferior retractors here and you try to ask the patient to look up and down uh, and you can just feel that tug when the whenever the patient moves the globe from upwards to downward position you can feel that tug that is an indication to say that you have got the structure uh, right and only only if you identify this uh, structure by this particular test you can uh, you get very good surgical results without that sometimes you might just uh, suture of the conjunctiva or the orbital fascia and you think you might have done a jones procedure and that will produce a failed uh, uh, surgical uh, result which you might require a resurgery also okay so this is a patient of an entropion you can see this is almost done in 2005 2005 and this are the this is probably within the first week of uh, surgery and uh, whenever there is a significant horizontal lid laxity you can try to complement this jones procedure with a lateral tarsal strip procedure also that will correct the horizontal lid laxity so a lateral canthotomy make an incision in the lower lid fashion out a tarsal plate you remove the conjunctiva on the inner side you take the tarsal plate remove the conjunctiva there and with a non observable stitch the anchor that slightly above the lateral canthal tendon attachment to the orbital margin periosteum and this will give a very taut lower lid and it will correct your horizontal lid laxity here you see this was taken i think the first day after surgery this for picture this will collect the horizontal lid laxity this you can combine this is the case which i showed you earlier this is another case which required both a jones procedure and your tarsal strip procedure this is another elderly lady a very elderly lady she was almost 88 years old in this case also we got excellent results this is another case these are taken within the first uh, first or second day after surgery and this is another patient whose cornea was compromised a jones procedure works in almost all the cases where there is pure vertical lid laxity and even in a case of recurrent this is another case which had undergone surgery elsewhere we didn't know what surgery was done we did a jones procedure the patient is absolutely normal the lid is normal in a case of severe enough thalamus the deep seated eyeball you can see there is orbital atrophy the um, eyeballs are deep and in such cases also this uh, jones procedure works and uh, more so if there is a lateral canthal laxity you can complement it with a horizontal lid laxity so in this uh, pro particular procedure wherein we got a consecutive ectropion following a modified velars procedure we corrected the horizontal lid laxity by a tarsal strip procedure and the patient is all right sometimes we might have to do a combined blepharoplasty approach also next i i would like to briefly touch upon uh, cicatricial entropion cicatricial changes mainly see mainly i told you there is an anterior lamella and the posterior lamella for an entropion to occur because of cicatricial reason, reasons entropion the changes have to be in the posterior part of the lower lid posterior part of the lid that is your posterior lamella more so it has to be the diseases of the conjunctiva mainly and because of this diseases of the conjunctiva there will be contracture of the conjunctiva there will be scarring of the conjunctiva there will be a diseased conjunctiva and basically there will be shortening of the conjunctiva and because of this there is a disparity of the length in the anterior lamella and the posterior lamella as a result of this you get interning of the lower lid this can occur at any age cicatricial entropion can occur at any age it can be acute or it can be even subacute also uh, unlike your involution entropion which is a chronic thing we can see in a subacute case of um, cicatricial entropion especially in a case of steven johnson syndrome and ocular ocular cicatricial pemphigoid also and i told you in a case of atrophy and it is very easy to avert the lid 
or just to retract the lead in a case of involutional entropy and whereas in a case of secretarial entropy it is very very difficult to avoid the lead even though you try to use a desmarais retractor also it is very difficult and you entropy and lead retracts on down gas and down gas it will try to retract more the causes are autoimmune causes steven johnson trauma it can be either a physical trauma or a chemical trauma this is another common cause surgical post surgical uh, following post uh, inoculation post dosis also you can get entropy and changes cicatricial changes and infectious causes trachoma seen in the northern part of our country and herpes zoster also can produce cicatricial entropy these are some of our cases this is one of my case only a tarsal uh, tarsal frontal sling earlier before we used to get silicon rods we used to use uh, proline sutures and this has uh, this had uh, this has resulted in an entropy uh, then uh, removing the uh, removing the tarsal uh, frontal sling that proline and uh, putting it properly corrected that entropy and also these are other changes post trauma post uh, steven johnson this is uh, some unknown cause we don't know what is the cause and the patient had an entropy and and uh, this is another case and basically the choice of operation in a case of upper lid spastic cicatricial entropy and depends upon the severity of the entropy and you have to identify whether the entropy is very severe and mainly you should try to see whether the tarsal plate is proper or not whether it is thick or thin and you should try to assess the state of the tarsal tarsal plate and also the conjunctiva also and the degree of lid retraction also supposing if it is a very very mild uh, cicatricial entropy and you can try to do just a anterior lamellar reposition anterior lamellar reposition you can do and you can correct and the other things moderate cases to severe cases if there is a thin tarsus if the tarsal plate is thin and if the tarsal plate is thick the uh, approach is slightly different if the tarsal plate is thin you can try to do a lamellar division you can make an incision in the gray line and you can separate the two supposing if the tarsal plate is very thick on the from the anterior part you can just try to resect a wedge of tarsal plate i don't have the step by step uh, pictures of this but i'll show you the clinical photographs and supposing if there is severe keratinization you can try to do a terminal uh, tarsal uh, rotation like a tabets operation and uh, this is usually seen in steven johnson syndrome with keratinization what we commonly corneal surgeon called as a lid viper epitheliopathy okay so mild mild cases with a with a normal with and without a normal tarsal plate the approach is totally different and along with this see these are the procedures which we have to think of without a graft and supposing if there is a severe cicatricial change on the posterior lamella we have to supplement it with a graft on the posterior part the posterior lamella requires a replacement either from the buccal mucosa nasochondral mucosa the palatal part or the tarsal conjunctival composite graft also can be used but the commonest thing what we usually do is the buccal mucosal graft so sometimes what we can do along with the anterior lamellar separation we can try to cut a small wedge of tarsal plate after you resect the anterior lamellar plate and try to shorten the lid so that the lid will lever outwards that, that that is the lid which has turned inwards will try to turn outwards and um, sometimes you can make an incision in the lid margin near the gray line and this you can supplement it with a mucous membrane graft also this will eliminate your lid viper epitheliopathy and in severe cases along with these cases even though you were uh, this is your wedge resection tarsal wedge resection and anterior lamellar uh, separation and with a posterior uh, uh, mucous membrane graft sometimes you might uh, have to fracture the tarsal plate and try to do a marginal rotation also and uh, in severe cases you have to do a posterior lamellar grafting with a mucous membrane or a conjunctiva this is one of our case of uh, upper eyelid uh, entropian spastic entropian secondary to steven johnson we have done a wedge uh, resection anterior lamellar separation and a lid splitting procedure this is another case the elderly lady we did a simple uh, lid uh, split uh, with a mucous membrane graft the patient became normal after the procedure so these are the references and uh, main inputs of this uh, presentation were mainly from uh, 
the professor collins lecture which i heard at uh, uh, hyderabad in 2012 and uh, professor collins says no operation designed to correct the aging changes that affect the late tissues can be completely successfully can be completely successful since by definition these changes are all progressive that is the final word so in spite of all these uh, limitations uh, a proper understanding of the anatomy of the lit structures the pathophysiological changes which occurs as a result of aging the dynamic factors which will influence the lid which uh, to keep it in its normal position and identifying the various uh, um, uh, anatomical defects by various tests uh, and try to formulate a surgical plan identifying the anatomical defects and try to successfully correct them will try to give us appropriate uh, results for your innovation and entropia thank you very much Thank you so much. Yeah. Say yeah. yeah, okay, thank you so much, sir, for that very very comprehensive lecture. I know the topic was uh like very ex expansive. I think upper lid, lower lid, you covered everything yeah. so very well in detail. And the videos I didn't show purposefully because most of the videos by Santosh Anwar, it is excellent. I think after you listen to this um, lecture, basic understand understand the concepts. Uh, Uh, seeing those uh, videos of uh, dr santosh anwar and various other beautiful procedures on the net no you will understand it better that is what i feel for sure sir and another very important lesson for all our pgs is like how well the documented pictures are there even like 20 year old surgery you had pictures and all yeah, the yeah. for those surgeries so that was really nice to see uh, so we have few, few questions from our uh, post graduate students and the viewers online and i think some of your students and uh, people from minto are also here yeah. so the platform is open to them if they want to ask something to sir you can put that in the chat box and i'll just take the questions from there so some of the questions from the social media portal is um, indications for transcutaneous approach versus transconjunctival approach for entropion surgery when would you want to go for the transcutaneous versus a transconjunctival approach that is for innovation and entropy on yes sir now basically we advise in most of the cases it is a transcutaneous approach only not a transconjunctival approach okay so i showed my presentation a transcutaneous approach only correct sir yeah. and the so transcutaneous approach sir, any uh, particular points to take care like just for our post graduate students like how much millimeter below uh, i told you know 4 to 5 millimeter below the lash line make an incision and i think and it is well yeah. hidden in the lower lid crease yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah so i think uh, that answers that question and another thing that you had shown sir uh, from the collins lecture also etiopathological basis for senile entropion but that is like the most favorite question whenever an entropion case comes up so mm -hmm. if you can just quickly uh, touch upon those four points of all, what all to look i think um, I, uh, almost six to seven times i repeated actually yes. Mm -hmm. and uh, with pictures i explained also yes, those sir. points are described very well in our kanski textbook only mm -hmm. basically you know we should remember that basically lamellar separation is the most important thing in involutional entropy mm -hmm. okay next is your inferior retractor dehiscence that is laxity of the inferior retractors that is vertical instability the last part is the horizontal lid laxity because of these factors in this order what usually happens the preceptal part of the, there is dehiscence of the inferior retractors so what will happen that vertical pull is lost so so the preceptal part of the orbicularis sacculi muscle which is below your tarsal plate that will slightly roll over the pre tarsal part that is why in one of the profile of photographs which i showed you you can see that thick muscle that the thick muscle of the lower lid especially in case of involutional entropy next time you see in a case of uh, involutional entropy the lid muscle will be slightly thick because of hypertrophy of your uh, orbicular sacculi whereas in a case of ectropion the lid orbicular sacculi is not visible at all that is one thing next is in addition to that there will be a little bit of uh, horizontal lid laxity also because of this both vertical and horizontal instability what usually happens the lid will slightly roll inwards because of the mainly because of this uh, laminar separation and your vertical uh, instability and i more so is supposing if the patient has got in addition to all these things patient has got uh, a little bit of age related enough thalmus the posterior support also is lost 
so the lid will automatically fall backwards because of the, the, the muzzle is tightening it like this this uh, tendons are lax posterior support is lost it will not fall like this it will fall like this whereas in a case of ectropion what happens the uh, skin will becomes loose the orbicular sacculi will undergo atrophic changes ischemic changes degenerative changes just like a rubber band it will become very lax so the support like this is gone that is your that is those are your uh, protractors uh, the orbicular sacculi they will they'll become very lax in addition to that what happen the tarsal plate will become hypertrophied inflammatory changes hypertrophied and it will become slot of wobbly like thing so what we and uh, of course there also you get enough thermal the post support is lost so the lid will fall out outwards like this because of the large tarsal plate and laxity of the protractor protractors also it will fall like this in a ectropion it is more the more of the horizontal lid laxity which is which comes first of course there is a vertical lid uh, laxity also sometimes you see some of the ectropion procedures we have to do a tars jones procedure also because we have to identify that uh, vertical instability also that will correct that yeah yeah ma yeah so i think what uh, the postgraduate should remember is you should be very thorough with your anatomy and if you start thinking anatomically and mm -hmm. how the uh, anatomy changes with age i think you will be able to answer this question very well and uh, so the next one is uh, what all precautions should we take while searching for lower lid retractor as you had shown uh, like the tug and everything what all precautions and how to identify the lower lid retractor no, no basically what we should do your surgery should be traumatic a traumatic actually basically it should be a traumatic not many will be having not medical colleges all medical colleges will be having the luxury of having a um, this thing kelman um, radio frequency this thing diathermy unit so the surgeries what i showed you are all uh, done around 15 years back 15 20 years back with regular uh, 15 number bard barker blade you have to be gentle in your uh, handling of the tissues that is one thing and try to use only instruments which are not very pointed that is try to use a smooth forceps you don't have to use a pierce oskins forceps because most of the time we try to use a cataract uh, instrument which has become slightly not uh, good for a corneal uh, thing for an oculoplasty thing try to get a, either either a small serrated uh, uh atraumatic forceps and try to first you make the incision try to swab that area gently so that there is no distortion of the tissues also just don't try to mop it roughly just you can take a finger swab just try to put a swab there just press it on that so that the hemostasis occurs then you gently retract retract the orbicular sacculi muscle you can use a simple muscle hook also or you can use a simple lid retractors also okay then afterwards you will see the orbital septum there and then you go do, lower down you first you identify the tarsal plate you see the tarsal plate you identify the tarsal plate then you will go lower down then you can see there is a white line there and then with an atraumatic forceps which is non tot you try to pick it up gently and try to pull it up slightly and if you want i can show you a video also and ask the patient to look up and down and once you hold that uh, structure gently and don't move your eye Uh, move, move your hand, sorry, and uh, ask the patient to move, move up and down. You can feel that tug. Once you feel that tug, it indicates that you have got the inferior retractus. Okay, then of course you can anchor it to the tarsal plate. Sure, sir. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what is the end point of the entropion uh, surgery? How to avoid overcorrection? uh basically your suturing should not be very very tight slightly there should be a slight aversion of the lid it should not be so tight so that the lid will totally avert outwards so else you'll get a consecutive ectropion it should not be so basically it is very difficult to get a case of uh, consecutive ectropion following jones surgery in my experience that is my understanding and basically sometimes what will happen they try to remove excess uh, skin there supposing if you remove too much of skin also sometimes you can produce an anterior lamellar shortening and can can produce an ectropion that you should keep it uh, uh, keep a note on that basically the end point of your correction you should see that the lid margin is slightly averted probably around 1 mm slightly the eyelashes just fall away from the ocular surface yeah sir i think the last one is uh, how to differentiate epibephron and congenital entropion sir that uh, you read up textbooks that is better for you people huh? 
this is a question which we will be asking you there are all the standard textbook descriptions you have to read up uh, sure sir uh, so thank you so much i think that okay. covers all our questions for today and thank you so much for your comprehensive lecture basically a take home message for all the students is basically whatever cases they see in the clinics they have to read about that case each and every day and basically they should be thorough with certain standard textbooks they should read the books and they should refer other books also for uh, uh, more knowledge uh, it is not just reading the net and listening to the webinars you will get all the information basically a homework has, be, has to be done and uh, you should keep on studying textbooks and of course you can supplement your uh, reading with uh, excellent clinical material available on the internet thank you very much that thank was the reason i didn't answer that question i'm sorry if i have disappointed anybody else no no definitely not sir that uh, yes. the answer i would have given is only what is given in textbooks only that's all yes thank you thank you thank you thank you so much sir thank, thank you so much for spending your time with us thank this you. thank you thank you and thanks to santosh also and you also excellent comparing thank you sir thank you thank you and so next we meet on august 11th which will be a lecture by dr chinmay uh, from into eye hospital again okay. upper and lower eyelid ectropion uh, okay. so see you all there Thank you thank you so much uh, good night good night thank sir. you thank you